Chapter 7, Introduction to Sampling Distributions. In this video, we'll learn how to calculate the mean and standard deviation for the sampling distribution of a particular sample mean. We'll also talk about the importance of the central limit theorem. So hopefully you've already watched the bunnies and dragons video in our Chapter 7 resources before uh, continuing on with this one. Recall in Chapter 2, we learned about frequency distributions where we'll take the values of a particular distribution and we can graph the values to create a histogram. Similarly, when we're working with sampling distribution, this is where we're going to take the distribution of all possible values of a statistic, say the sample mean, for a given sample size that has been randomly selected from the population. In other words, if we took all of the possible random samples of a particular size and calculated the sample mean for each one and then graphed it into a histogram, we would get a sampling distribution. Now there are a number of theorems in this chapter that are going to help us work with sampling distributions. The first theorem is regarding the average value of our sample means. In other words, for any population, if I took all of our possible sample means and I calculated the average value of them, it's going to be the same as our population mean. Because if I'm studying every possible sample in a population, I'm essentially studying the entire population itself. We will write it as our mu of our sample means is the same as our population mean. Theorem two is known as the standard deviation of sample means, also known as the standard error. If I take all of my possible samples and I take their sample means, the standard deviation of these is population standard deviation divided by the square root of n. Theorem 3 states that if a population is normally distributed, that means it's bell-shaped, then our sampling distribution of our sample mean is also normally distributed, or also bell-shaped. And this allows us to apply Theorem 1 and Theorem 2 regarding our mean and our standard deviation of the sample means, or the standard error. Now in Theorem 4, which you watched a video on it regarding bunnies and dragons, for simple random samples of n observations taken from a population, regardless of the population's distribution, so regardless of whether it's normally distributed, or if it's skewed, or if it's bimodal, as long as the sample size is sufficiently large, then the distribution of our sample means is approximately normal again allowing for theorems 1 and 2 to apply. So regardless of what our population distribution shape is, if I were to pull every possible sample and calculate the sample mean for each and then plot those values into a graph or a histogram, it's going to be normally distributed. It'll be bell-shaped. That's helpful to us because we know that if we're working with a bell-shaped curve, we can use Excel to find the probability of an event occurring. Note that the larger the sample size, the better the approximation to the normal distribution. So regarding the central limit theorem, this saves us a lot of time when we're trying to find the probability of an event. Regardless of what our population distribution shape is, it could be uniform, triangular, skewed. When we have a large enough sample size, our sampling distribution will be bell-shaped. Now some things to note about the central limit theorem our sample size must be sufficiently large. If the population is quite symmetric, then even small sample sizes like two or three can provide a normally distributed sampling distribution. We don't work with this too often though. If the population is highly skewed or irregularly shaped, such as bimodal, then the required sample size will be larger. Note that a conservative definition of a sufficiently large sample size is n will be greater or equal to 30. So thinking about our research projects with our Airbnb data, as long as you have more than 30 listings after you've cleaned and deleted any Airbnb listings you didn't want, we can use the central limit theorem when we want to calculate the probability of a particular event. In the last few chapters, we've been converting our x values into z values. Similarly, we can standardize our sampling distribution into z values. And recall, a z-value simply measures the number of standard deviations a particular value is from the mean. So here's our formula for our z-value, and it'll look familiar or very similar to what we learned in chapter 6. 
here we've got our sample mean minus our population mean, which is essentially our sampling error, and then we divide it by our standard error, or the standard deviation divided by our square root of n. This is the component that we learned about in theorem 2. Now if we convert our value into a z value, that means we can use Excel to find the probability of an event happening. Recall this is why we convert our x values into z values, because it allows us to use Excel to do the heavy lifting and calculations for us. Let's look at problem 23 on our worksheet. Suppose a population is known to be normally distributed with a population mean of 2000 and a population standard deviation of 230. If a random sample size of n equals 8 is selected, we're going to calculate the probability that the sample mean will exceed 2100. So in step 1, we're going to identify our sample mean, where our sample mean we're examining is going to be 2100. In step 2, we will uh, define our sampling distribution thanks to our uh, theorems 1 and theorem 2. Recall theorem 1 states that if I take all my possible sample means and I calculate the average of them, it's the same as my population mean. Since we already know my population mean is 2000, we have that for our theorem 1. In theorem 2, we are calculating the standard error or the standard deviation of our sample means. So we'll take our population standard deviation of 230 and divide it by the square root of our sample size. In this case, it's 8. So when I take 230 divided by the square root of 8, we get a standard error of 81.32. Now keep note of these because you're going to need it for the next few steps. In step 3, we'll define the event of interest. We want to know the probability that our sample mean is greater than 2100, or in the problem it said exceeded. Exceeded is the same thing as greater than. In step 4, we will convert our sample mean into a z-value. So we'll plug in our sample mean of 2100, our mean of 2000, and we will divide it by the standard error. So there's my 2100 minus our 2000, and the standard error that we calculated on the last slide is 81.32. I like to make sure my order of operations are correct, so I always work in components as I do my math. And so I'll simplify uh, our 2100 minus 2000, which is 100. This right here represents our sampling error and then I will divide it by our standard error. And that'll give us 1.23 as our z value. So in step five, how do we use Excel to find this desired probability? I find it helpful to draw what I'm interested in. Here's our normal distribution curve. And so if I had to map out our z value of the 1.23, it'll be right around here. And since I want to know greater than 2100, that's the same as saying greater than our z value of 1.23. So I shade in this tail right here. And then I have to figure out which Excel formula to use. So I always ask myself, is the event of interest a greater or less than z value statement? And so it's greater than, which we identified in our step three. And so I'm going to use the 1 minus our norm.s.distribution, where I plug in my z value and comma and true. And I'll show you that in just a sec. In this chapter, because we are doing the z values by hand, we use this formula where it says norm.s.dist and then put that z value in. And we always use true for the cumulative because we want to find the probabilities in this area right here. We're adding up all the little probabilities in this shaded area. So let me show you what it looks like in Excel. So here's our um, for two formulas here for the normal distribution. This formula is used when we're looking at less than or equal to some number. And this is the formula used for greater than or equal to some number. And if you look right here, this is the example we were just working on. So I'll go ahead and type equals 1 minus norm.s.dist, parentheses. The z value we found was the 1.23. I'll type in comma and then true, and then close out. And so the probability is 0 
And so what that means is the probability that our sample mean is greater than 2100 is 0 0.1093 or 10.93% chance. And when we look at our shaded area or our shape, I can verify this visually using my observation skills. Yes, this is a small area. It should be something small like 10.9%, for instance. If I typed in my formula and I got something drastically different, like 0.95 or 90%, but that does not match my drawing, then I know that I've made an error. Perhaps I used the wrong formula in Excel. So you want to not only understand the concepts, practice the formulas, but also use your common sense and observation skills to verify if our distribution and our event of interest match the results that you got in Excel. So if you have any questions, just let me know.